Last week we saw Paul do a pretty lengthy introduction to the book of Colossians. He is writing the book of Colossians, or the letter to the church of Colossae, because there is an error in their church. Every letter that Paul wrote except Philippians was written to correct an error. Philippians is the only letter of Paul that contains no rebuke, no correction. And the next thing that Paul does is something that, well, I'd never do. He actually thanks God for their faith, love, and hope. Now, if there's somebody that I have something against, perhaps somebody has hurt me, perhaps I have been under a ministry where they have spoken some grievous biblical error. If I'm going to talk to them about it, the first thing I'm not going to say is, boy, I really thank God for you. I'm going to get right to the point. And I'm going to tell them what's wrong. So Paul not only thinks this, he actually wrote it in a letter to them so that they could see that he is thankful for them. He is thankful for their faith, love, and hope. And he's especially thankful that they are growing Christians. The idea of thankfulness, thanksgiving, thanks, giving thanks, gratitude, all of this appreciation for what has been done is a theme that is in the Bible, but it is lost in our society. When I was in seminary, we discussed and uncovered many themes that are in the Bible. Themes are things that appear everywhere. Forgiveness is a theme in the Bible. You can open up pretty much any book in the Bible and you will see a story of forgiveness. So because it goes from Genesis to Revelation, we call it a theme. Thankfulness, thanksgiving, giving thanks, gratitude is a theme that is in the Bible. Every book of the Bible shows us some aspect of giving thanks and giving thanks to God. There are some examples of this. First Chronicles, oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon His name. Give thanks to the Lord because His mercy endures forever. Sing praise to the Lord, you saints of His, and give thanks at the remembrance of His holy name. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and sing praises to your name, O Most High. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, occurs 71 times in the Bible, a lot of them in the Psalms. And so if you say, well, I don't know what to thank God for, well, you can thank Him because He's good. Because He does good things, because He is good to you. Give thanks to the Lord for His mercies endure forever occurs 60 times. The idea of giving thanks to the Lord occurs over 600 times in the Bible. People do it. It is part of having a relationship with God. Why is everybody so eager to thank God? In the Bible. Well, some time ago, I knew a lady who worked with her, and she was always kind of grumpy, always kind of down. She could find something to complain about in everything that happened at work. And I said, Why don't you come up with one thing that you're thankful for? kind of snarled at me and said, there's nothing in this world that is worth giving thanks for. And I thought, wow. On one hand, that's a pretty narrow view. On the other hand, she clearly did not know God. Because if you have just a slight relationship with God, you will realize that God has blessed you 
beyond your wildest dreams. And you need to be thankful for what He's done. What this means is, God is not mundane. God is not boring. God is not run-of-the-mill. God is not average. When He blesses you, when He shows mercy to you, it is beyond anything we can imagine. You can sit down and spend weeks writing down your biggest and wildest dreams on a piece of paper. And God looks at that and says, that's just the start. We cannot imagine what God is doing right now. What God is doing in sending His angels to take care of us. How God's love is actively impacting us at this very moment. And we certainly cannot imagine heaven and what it will be like. I assure you, there are amazing and wonderful things beyond that light at the end of the tunnel that everybody seems to see. Heaven is much more than just a tunnel and a light. It is the presence of God. The problem is, we are sinful humans. And we have this sin nature, what Paul calls the flesh. This flesh can impact our vision the way we see things. If we look at the world through our flesh, through our human mind, we will always be dissatisfied. It has been shown that if you sit there for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and watch TV, it will actually affect your blood pressure and your heart rate. Not in a good way. That is because the way advertising is put together today, their goal is to make you dissatisfied with your current situation, with your current car, with your current house, with your current relationships, with your current phone, and go and say, wait a minute, what they're saying is if I buy their car, I will be happy. And I will have joy. So I'm going to go right out and buy their car. And then I find out that two weeks later they have a new one. And mine is no longer good enough. And I am dissatisfied again. The sin nature, the sin mind is always after get more, get bigger, get better. And that's where greed comes from. The more that I want, if I let that get out of control, can become very selfish, very ambitious, very greedy, and God is blessing me, and I don't even see it. You see, if I'm not receiving God's blessings, it isn't because He isn't giving them. It is because I put up an umbrella of sin and shielded myself from what God has for me. Yet if you know Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit. You have the ability to see things with spiritual eyes. And if you see the world through the Spirit, you can be thankful because you can fully understand what God has said. You can partially understand what God has done. God is showering you with mercies and blessings. And we say, but... I stub my toe. Because I stub my toe, I am going to ignore God's blessings. The way the world works is there's sin in it. There's four truths about trouble. First is the world is broken by sin. Sin has been working for thousands of years in this world. And it has been working on the minds of people, in the lives of people, in the relationships, and the world is broken. Therefore, if you have these expectations of perfection for your machines like your car, your heater, they will let you down. If you have these expectations of altruistic perfection for your elected officials, they will let you down. People will let you down. Things will let you down. The weather will let you down. They're saying it might rain Wednesday in the middle of August. How about that? Things do not happen 
the way we expect them to happen because we have this desire for perfection but the world is so broken it cannot provide that. Second, all people are sinful. And because all people are sinful, nobody's perfect. Nobody is sinless. And so if I put my expectation on people in my relationships, they will let me down. And I can put my own selfish view of how the world should be on other people, and that will just destroy relationships. Third, Satan doesn't like people working for God. Uh, there are direct satanic attacks. Those are few and far between today because Satan has most of the world working on his behalf. He doesn't have to show up and do things himself. He just starts things in motion, and we take care of his work for him. Uh, last night, we were trying to, Janelle and I, trying to print the newsletter, which is out in the lobby. Uh, I was working on my sermon. And there we are, printer jam, paper jam, vital software wouldn't work, computers wouldn't turn on. You name it, every problem that we could have had in preparing for today occurred. Now, I could say, well, that's a direct result of Satan showing up in my house and messing with things. But it didn't even have to be that profound. Because sinful people built my printer and my computer, and because everybody has this view of perfection, things just do break. And the test is, when things do break, do I curse them? Do I curse God? Some people curse God. Or do I say, God is above this. God is in this. God will get me through this great trauma of being unable to print. And on the other side, I will be able to look back on it and see it as mostly insignificant. But you say, but I have major traumas in my life. There is no major trauma that is greater than God's love for you. There is no major trauma that is so large it blots out God's blessings. Pretend, if you will, that you have these scales. And on one hand, you put everything that God has done for you, everything that God has done throughout history, Everything that God has done. Okay? Pretty weighty. Over here, put every single problem you've had in your life, every single catastrophe, every single sickness, every single trauma, and it doesn't even move the scales. God's love for you is so great, nothing we experience will prove Him wrong and will block his love. Fourth truth about trouble, God wants you and I to grow. You say, well, that's no good. I don't want to grow that way. There is a truth, and it has been studied for 5,000 years. People, you and I, will remember more and learn more if there is a trauma involved. They had actually done studies where they were teaching people difficult math and hitting their toe with a hammer. Not heavily, just enough so they'll go, ow! And the people actually remembered how to do the tough math than when the people weren't experiencing pain. It is a strange way that we are built, but we remember things more when they're associated with pain. So in James it is written, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for we know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. You have a trial, you have a difficulty, we are told to count it all joy, because the result of that over time, 
will be deeper faith and more complete faith. God can turn and does turn every trial in your life into gold. Nothing is wasted. God does not look at your life and go, wow, how am I going to work with that? God looks at your life and sees opportunity after opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. We see things we don't like. God sees opportunity for his love and mercy to shine through. And so we need to be thankful because we understand these things that God is doing. We understand who God is and that he never stops loving us. There are six benefits to being thankful. The first is it calms complaining and grumpy moods. If you are grumpy, if you find yourself being complaining, pull out a piece of paper or close your eyes and think of three things that you're thankful for. It doesn't have to be necessarily things that God has done. It can be you know, thankful for the stuff you have or thankful for something you read. If you're stuck, you can always thank God for his love and mercies and for Jesus Christ. It soothes distress if things are just falling apart. If you do not know what to do, if you're at your wit's end, a good way to get out of this is to be thankful, to prayer, pray prayers of thankfulness. Pray back to God what you are thankful for. It helps overcome anxiety. Anxiety is a, is a rough thing today because lots of people get it. It doesn't necessarily cure it. But if you are feeling anxious, if you are feeling out of control, being thankful can help center us into what God is saying. Fourth, it leads to repentance. The Christian life is a life of repentance. We are to be constantly turning from our sin and turning toward God. And if we get caught up in our own way, it's very easy to say, I don't need repentance. I'm doing pretty good. I'm okay. I'm on the right road. I'm doing fine. I have no problems. But if you begin to thank God for what he's done, God can begin to open your eyes to what your life really is and what we need to repent from. It brings hope. Hope is a tough one today, especially with the economy, especially with the news today, what's going on in Washington. You begin to thank God for what he has done through history. He has a track record of being there through everything. It can help us have hope in our modern situation. And last, it strengthens endurance. You might say, I can't go on. I can't do this job. I can't manage these kids. I can't do all these things that are in my life. You begin to thank God, and it will actually increase your endurance. 1 Thessalonians says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. We can, if we are in tune with God, give thanks in every situation. We don't necessarily thank God for everything, but since God turns everything around, we can eventually get to the point where I think we can thank God for everything and thank God in everything. Now, we may not understand. It may hurt. We may have a major trauma we're going through. We can still learn to be thankful for the things in God that do not change, for his love, for Jesus Christ. And that will help us get beyond the pain. Thanksgiving brings total and absolute satisfaction. You need satisfaction in life. Thanksgiving is a great way to get there. Listing off all the things that God has done for you and ruminating on them, meditating on them, does a great thing for putting our spirit centered in God's will, centered in God's way of thinking about things. Now, several years ago, 
uh, a survey was sent out. It was a survey on thankfulness, and the question was posed, uh, how can you be thankful if your kids are always on drugs or something like that? They would ask questions like that. And these are some of the responses they got, and they aren't necessarily Christ-centered, but it does show you can put a thankful spin on every situation. I am thankful for the wife who says it's the same boring food tonight because she is home with me and not out with someone else. I am thankful for the husband who is on the sofa being a couch potato because he is home with me and not out at the bars. I am thankful for the taxes I pay because it means I am employed. I am thankful for the clothes that fit a little snug because it means I have more than enough to eat. I am thankful for a lawn that needs mowing, windows that need cleaning, and gutters that need fixing because it means I have a home. So many people complain about all the chores around the home. At least you have one. I am thankful for all the complaining to hear about the government because it means we have freedom of speech. I am thankful for the parking spot I find at the far end of the parking lot because it means I am capable of walking and I have been blessed with transportation. And I know many people it will ruin their day if they don't get to park right in front of the door. I am thankful for the person behind me in church who sings off key because it means I can hear. <laughs> I'm thankful for the pile of laundry and ironing because it means I have clothes to wear. I'm thankful for the alarm that goes off in the early morning hours because it means I am alive. And where it could be worse than getting up early with the alarm. And I am thankful for all the trials, troubles, and tribulations because it means I have a Lord and Savior who loves me and cares for me. The bottom line is, Christians need to be thankful, grateful people. We need to be thankful to God and thankful to those around us. Modern psychologists call it an attitude of gratitude. Kind of rolls off the tongue. However you do it, we need to be people who are grateful, who are thankful. One exercise that some people recommend is every night before you go to bed, pull out a piece of paper and write five things you are grateful for. And then go to bed with a grateful attitude. And it might actually change your night and change the next day. Thank people for small blessings. Thank God regularly, and you will build a life of thanksgiving, you will build a life of thankfulness, and God will give you endurance and peace, get rid of your anxiety, and put you in the center of His will, because you have learned to thank Him for all those blessings. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, I just thank you for all of the amazing things you have done, for all of the wonderful blessings you have given us, for the strength to get up and come here today, as there are many who just do not have that physical strength. Lord, I praise you and thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross that I may have eternal life with you. Lord, we praise you for all these things and ask your blessing upon the remainder of the day. And I ask this through the cross of Christ. Cross of Christ.